It's easy to say that the cross is at the front when the bookends are so violent compared to the selfless son. But I've tried to be and I've tried to see like him. Okay. Well, welcome to another episode of Apocalypse Here Podcast. It's not just another episode, it's our first official episode back. We did one, if you caught it live, a little while back, but we're going to make this the first episode because, yeah, we just it was kind of like a reaction thing or whatever, and we kind of want to do our own topic like this. I think this will be a lot better place to start this whole next batch or season of episodes, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, so we're excited to be back and happy to see some people in the live chat already which is pretty cool jonathan becker and i know some other people watching so yeah thanks everybody for joining us live and like always once we'll do this live and then what we do is we put on we take it down then re-upload it just with some little bits and pieces cut out just to make it a more concise podcast but easier to listen to for people but yeah so thank you for joining us live and if you want to support us more definitely just like the video subscribe to the channel and leaving comments helps but there's also our patreon patreon.com slash apocalypse here if you want to support us in that way so yeah like i said we really appreciate it and we're really excited for this episode because we got john and laura on the other screen over there who yeah it's always a joy when she comes on to add another (laughs) perspective (laughs) and yeah she's got plenty to say for sure a lot knows a lot more than me so i am so luck we're recording yeah. this for the, when the powers that be uh, put this back online after the episode. I do have a hard stop at nine because The Last of Us is on <laughs> tonight. So you guys can go as long as you want, but I will be piecing out to watch The Last of Us. So. Which is fair. Yeah. Yeah. That so. yeah. no, sounds good. It's a good show. Well, right? yeah. So. Yeah. I wouldn't know I haven't seen it, but I'll take That's your good. word for it. You should. <laughs> You should all get off Wait. at night and watch the last of us. No, 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 no. Wait. No. Don't do this. Okay, Don't do this to us. Right. But yeah, so. <laughs> Why is John flipping us off in this picture? I didn't even notice. Um, in the, in the intro? Yeah. I think he's just playing the bass. Yeah, but I I mean, depending on the shape that I'm playing, it might be flipping okay. somebody off. It's quite yeah. possible. But yeah. If I am, then I stand by it. So <laughs> Yeah, there are good reasons for it, I'm sure. But yeah, so today's episode, we're going to be, as you can see by the title, talking about gender, sexuality, those kind of things related to that in regards to theology, obviously, because that's kind of a little bit about what this channel is normally about. But yeah, so we're excited to be diving into a pretty controversial topic to say the least but yeah we hopefully we have some good things to say and can help some people kind of think about this in a more healthy way and just to help people think through these kind of tough topics because especially for myself like I have some some obviously like strong views but not this whole thing isn't definitely worked out for me there's definitely still more I want to learn and whatnot so I'm excited to kind of hear Laura come in with a lot of like the historical stuff in regards to this and some kind of get into the theology around it and whatnot. But yeah, so it mm-hmm. should be a really exciting episode. No, I'm, I'm sure people know who Laura is and New yeah. Testament, PhD, yeah. Duke University, um, previously chaplain and New Testament instructor at Fairham College, uh, religious studies instructor at Fairham College. Currently, uh, not that, but you know, we'll see what happens. So, currently moving to Indianapolis and settling in here. And she is here, which is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. So, I was listening, I saw Brandon Robertson, who we did the last mm-hmm. episode on, who's a progressive Christian pastor, mm-hmm. and he did a video on sexuality and homosexuality and whatnot in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And he started off by saying, like there was a survey or a study or whatever that they did and asked like a lot of people and like the number they asked people what's the first thing you think of when someone says christianity and like the top answer was anti-homosexual yeah or whatever homosexuality so (laughs) it's obviously like the standard response is to be anti against not Mm -hmm. affirming and whatnot so And I think if people know this channel and know us at all, you're going to know that we probably don't take that same view, which we obviously don't. We're so, 
Yeah, so I don't know if you want to kind of get into a little bit of like yeah, what the through. what the landscape is yeah. and like where yeah. this comes from. Yeah, well, I, I think where a lot of this stuff comes from is um, a, a a flattening of the historical record and what has historically been part of the Christian tradition. I think where I see, oh my gosh, we have another Indianapolis person. Oh my gosh, we should hang out. Seriously, we don't know anybody. <laughs> who is this? I don't know who yeah, this is. <laughs> Oh yeah. Uh, get drop give us your phone number. <laughs> no, don't, not on here. Um to be to be fair, based on if you take us like based on most YouTube comments, it's probably not someone you want to hang out with. But we'll, take, we'll take it that they're probably no, cool. But... I'm, I'm just no, but if, if you actually live here and want yeah. to like yeah, hang no, out, please hit us up. Yeah. Hit us up on Twitter, DM us, yeah. whatever. So yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. If you're a crazy person, don't do yeah, it. Please and, don't uh, do it. We will we will vet you. But Thomas, you seem very aggressively. nice. You seem very yeah. nice because you're on our stream. Yeah. Um, I have completely lost my train of thought. You know, I, I think where a lot of this stuff comes from is this idea of biblical sexuality. This idea that people have people in the Christian tradition have really latched onto this idea that there is a tradition that is taught in the Bible, um, over like in, included in tradition, but mostly from the Bible, at least on the Protestant side of things. Um, and that we can follow this model of gender, marriage, sex, uh, family. And if we just follow all of these prescriptions, we can get to the way God wants people to live, right? Um, there's a few issues with this. The modern person sees things in very discrete categories in a way that was not necessarily true in the era in which the Bible was written, right? For example, um, the concept of sex as a discrete thing that is apart from families, that is apart from marriage, that is apart from property and value, uh, is a very modern concept because you need birth control for that to be a thing that happens, right? To think of this as sort of an isolated category. Another big issue is flattening out the, bigger, the biblical record and sort of majoring on minors and minoring on majors to get a form of marriage from the Bible taught uniformly throughout that looks a lot like how more traditional people practice marriage today now, right? So for example, the idea that Adam and Eve is this clear story of biblical monogamy and uh, heterosexuality and that this is the thing we're all supposed to practice. And of course, this gets, this gets very complicated when we look at Adam and Eve's children and that they get married and they are marrying their siblings. And this introduces this question of, or if they are not marrying their siblings, they're marrying these other people this came from. So this is starting to already complicate this narrative a little bit. The idea that this is a nuclear family that's operating the way we do is, is quite complicated. It's very common for people to sort of blow off uh, polygamy, specific, uh, like multiple wives in particular, in the Old Testament is, oh, well, it never goes well in the Old Testament. So this is clearly not supposed to be normative, uh, to which one could easily say siblings don't ever go well in the Old Testament either. So you could probably make the same case that the Old Testament forbids multiple children uh, to one couple. My, my concern is that people look at the Bible and want to make the case that there is a case for the nuclear family headed by one heterosexual couple with two people in it and that this is uniformly taught throughout the new testament that's, uh, to the, uh, throughout the old and new testament that's not true at all it gets even more complicated when we get to the new testament yeah. and we have celibacy yeah. now introduced as an ideal um and so my, my, my point is, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So my, my point is, this is a thing that Christians have latched on to as representative of their faith, one man and one woman marrying and having kids, and then living apart from other institutions and sort of ma managing a family on their own. And this is very clearly a post-industrial phenomenon. And it doesn't really seem to have that much to do with the Greco-Roman world. Just to be clear, we do have, I do have multiple wives. Let's bring them in now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, uh, be nice to have I wanted to say yeah. something. <laughs> I held myself back. The cats just show up. Yeah. We make, we make too many stupid jokes in private, so this is a challenge, just so people know that. Like, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there, and that's kind of where I'm at with this, is that... Uh, 
I really just like when people say that there's like a clear picture of what marriage should be or gender or sexuality in the Bible. Like, I just think it's so far removed from where we're at in our modern world, what they're talking about that you just cannot take it at like a one-to-one at all. Like, I mean, I definitely think the Bible has things to say that we should listen to and like, Mm -hmm. like try and make comfort, like, understand them in our context today but sure it's yeah. definitely not a one-to-one the lay of the land is that the bible has no singular vision of what marriage looks like and it has no vision that corresponds to our version of marriage now based on who organizes marriage where it comes from how long it lasts who's involved in it um the relationship between sex and children there is no version of the bible that corresponds to ours it is taught throughout now how do people solve this one solution is people who insist that some biblical texts are more authoritative than others um yeah. in a very particular way that like the texts that look the most like marriage as it was practiced in the 20th century in the united states are more authoritative than texts that don't teach this right so that's one option that's available to us adam and eve as a sort of like predominant heterosexual couple Paul's counsel towards celibacy being sort of like a counsel of perfection that is actually not reachable or normative for people. Um, and the idea of, you know, divorce being only thing that happens in cases of adultery. So like, there's definitely, people have tried to solve the problem of there's no such thing as biblical marriage by selecting from the options available to us to construct something right. that looks a lot like post, that looks as much as possible like post-industrial marriage in the United States, right? right? That's one way to deal with this problem. My critique of that perspective would be that the hermeneutic involved to get there is not coherent. I would argue that if you can look at whatever hermeneutic you need to look at the Bible and get to one man and one woman married for life with no one else involved in like, also this is being sort of divorced from pop property. This is being primarily like a love match. My argument to that would be that there are texts in the Bible that are basically impossible to move around this. Um, so but like people do try yes. to make moves around. Well, that, right. That's the and, thing. And they, they and do. Like, and it doesn't and that, work. That, that's yeah. what, but it's also been convincing for yeah. a lot of people. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, and, yeah, it definitely depends on how you define works or whatever, because yeah. Yeah. it clearly I, does work because yeah, a lot yeah. of people, the majority yeah. of Americans are yeah. on board with it or yeah. whatever. I don't mean but to say I, Americans, but yeah. Yeah. Or like American evangelicals. So I, I would say in that situation, the thing that absolutely does not work is biblical accounts of God giving multiple wives to a person. I don't think that fits. Um, You can make the move that just because something is narrated in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's ideal. So just because Solomon had a bunch of wives doesn't mean that God wanted him to. In fact, there was a lot of problems with this. There's a lot. Okay, the thing that doesn't fit with that is that multiple times in the New Testament, it is stated that God gave multiple wives to a person, right? That seems like you can't move that. Um, David, that, that comes up particularly when uh, Nathan is confronting David uh, about taking Bathsheba, that God draws attention to the fact that he gave so many wives of his enemies to David. And uh, so like in light of this, his taking of Bathsheba is even more egregious. I would say that that is a major, major sticking point for the idea that God's ideal throughout the entire Bible is one man and one woman married. If God gave multiple wives to David, how was David supposed to know he wasn't supposed to have them, right? Um, I think that's a huge problem. Um, That shows up in depictions of Solomon gathering his wealth when wives are part of that. So Mm. I I, I generally think that that's the problem for the inheritance case that God never says it's good to get married to more than one woman. Um, he just, the Bible just depicts men marrying more than one woman. I think that's a huge problem for that case is that if God gives yeah. more than one woman to a man, then clearly that's not God's ideal. Right. So I think that's there, that that's that problem there. So I think we're back to the issue of whatever you want to say about the hierarchy of the Bible, there is more than one kind of ideal marriage, uh, proposed, including no marriage. So, so that's a problem. Well, first off, it's definitely 
only wives that people are given. I will sure. say yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like, there's no yeah. point in which a man was given a husband, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. there is that thing, and we and like mainly what this conversation like is about is homosexuality. Really, yeah. no one's debating polygamy. Sure. Necessarily, I mean people are, but and I understand where well, you're going. That you're just kind yeah. of laying out a rule that, like, well, you can't really say the Bible has this one mm. picture of marriage. Okay. But if your only thing you really brought up was polygamy, I feel like people have ways of sure. working out this, and it is just polygamy, right? Like it's definitely okay. not. So you are correct that when we look at the at the Bible. When we have people getting married to more than one person, it's always a man marrying more than one woman. And it's always a person doing it from a position of status. Um, and this is very much in line with what we know about how marriage works in pre-industrial societies. That uh, men who marry a lot of women usually do it as a way to secure diplomatic relationships um, because marrying the daughter of another king is a good way to forge those connections um being married to a lot of women is a way to demonstrate your status um being married to a lot of women is actually not a bad way for women to get a reasonable cut of riches in a society where wealth is controlled by men um in when you have these massive peasant classes that's better to get it's better to get a small cut of a large fortune than 100% of a cut of no fortune, right? So what does this all reveal, right? And then, of course, by the time we get to the New Testament, we still have marriages that are arranged in the script of the Roman world um, that, are not, that are not primarily love matches, that are coming from a society where people, you know, the, the aristocratic classes are still arranging their daughters' marriages and pulling them out of their marriages uh, quite frequently in order to make... Um, meaningful alliances, but even then this still happens in the peasant class, right? Uh, parents making sure that their kids are marrying people who can provide for them. So what does this tell us? What we don't ever see in this arrangement, like we can call this heterosexuality. We can call this, you know, look, it's never a man married to another man, but why is it never a man married to another man? It seems to not be related quite so much to the connection between the spouses in these situations. Uh, you know, when you're talking about these like large harem situations, it's not even clear how much interaction the man and the wife would actually have with one another, right? Um, if you have 500 wives, that might be something that you consummated one time and you never see them again, right? It doesn't seem like this is related to the essential uh, heterosexuality and complementarity of the pair. This seems to have a lot to do with the way in which men and women are figured in light of property. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is itself very revealing. It doesn't seem to be the case when God gives a lot of wives to David. It doesn't seem like the reason that is happening is because something essential about the meeting between essential femininity and essential masculinity is happening. Um, and that there's something about essential femininity that you need more of them than you need a man, right? It seems to be because that is not what marriage is about in this context. Marriage in this context is about property and like being able to take the previous king's wives as your own is not the sort of essential relationship meeting of the minds uh, between partners. It is because the women in this question are symbols of the king's property and fertility and uh, longevity. And by having sex with them in this legally, you know, uh, above board way, you get that king's authority, right? So it's very hard, I think, to make the case from these stories that's like, you know, well, even in these cases, it was heterosexual. It's not because there's something important about womanhood happening here. It's not because something is important happening in the meeting between a man and a woman. It's because... Women are objects and men are subjects. Yeah. And it doesn't make sense to pair up an object with an object or a subject with a subject. Uh, the power of men is being enacted on the bodies of women in order to solve these disputes between men. So to that, I would just say, this has nothing to do with how we think about marriage now. And it shouldn't have anything to do with how we think about marriage now. Um, and, and, and we can, you know, you can hike this back to... Adam and Eve, and fine, that's a different model of what this looks like, but also that model is not being shot through the rest of the Bible. 
Yeah. And it's also, it is not because God's creation has gotten away from him. This is something that God's clearly presiding over in a lot of the kings in the king, the Kings and Chronicles narratives. So I, I think we have to be honest that um, whatever you want to do with inspiration or whatever you want to do with authority or inerrancy of scripture, there is a model of who women are even as people and, and their agency and their independence um, which is not analogous to the way we think about women now in these texts. And that's the hermeneutical problem we have to solve. That's the problem we have to solve as readers and interpreters is not how do we deal with the fact that we want men to get married to each other, but men aren't getting married in the Bible. That's not the problem. The problem we're trying to solve is what do we do with the fact that women are not full humans and agents in this text? Yeah, I think you make a really good point for sure. And I think... I don't know, because I think a lot of, like, inerrantist people, I don't know, are just not going to be so on board with how you say, like, we think differently today. They may mm-hmm. want to come back and say, well, we should think more like they did in the Bible and not necessarily yeah, agree with you. <laughs> you are yeah. right. And then even then, we can't fully recreate yeah. this, right? Like, you yeah. can you could make the case that, you know, I, because th- there definitely is a, there's, there's definitely a gussied up version of patriarchy that sometimes reemerges in the evangelical spaces. You know, the idea of like dads protect their daughters until the husbands protect it. And again, like this just it, it is a, this is a thing we are projecting onto the ancient world that does not seem to be consistent in the text we have. So, so that, I mean, that's a fair concern. That's a fair complaint. The idea that, you know, some people would respond to this that, you know, like, well, they actually did have the lay of the land between men and women better than we do now. Um, and some of that is stuff I just can't argue back to because I, I, I do think that if you think that women are more analogous to like movable property, but that's kind of why I was to go with that is yeah. responding to this with, again, this sort of like gussied up version of biblical patriarchy as it's been remastered and recast in a lot of spaces sure. that like, yeah. Oh, this is this yeah. sort of protective thing. And it's like, women are so valuable and treasured that yeah. people, you know, okay, fine. You're projecting the absolute hell onto these passages. And, um, and even then you are wildly overestimating your ability as a modern person to, um, reconstruct the mindset of the people in these texts yeah. all i have is the text yeah all i yeah. have is the text that's in front of me and the way in which women are being treated in these texts and what they are doing and what i don't see there is relationality between men and women in the marriage relationship in a way that has anything to do with what we want to do now and if you want to say like if you squint you turn it 90 degrees you can see something else fine all i have is the text in front of me and mm-hmm. i'm just not i'm not convinced there are plenty of people that take it way too far and that's not the objection. Like you're right. At that point you can just say, I have nothing to say to those. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there is like, you said this like sort of fancied up version of, you know, patriarchy, but Mm -hmm. yeah. So I totally agree with you that like, like I said earlier too, that like the Bible doesn't give us a specific thing it has multiple perspectives on what marriage should be and like Mm -hmm. you said with the polygamy is definitely one that is clear it's obvious that like at some points this worked and was ordained by god in a way and we can't really just deny that the bible treats it as that the bible is clearly treats it was ordained by god and again i don't think as a modern reader we have to agree with the bible about that um, but I do think that as a reader of the Bible, you have to acknowledge that that's just what it you says. Be that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So that's where you kind of argue against the inerrantist for sure. Yeah. That or or you certain can't models say. of inerrancy, right? Yeah. You know, there, there are some sort of more flexible accounts of the authority of scripture that are not quite and, and, and again like i would need those representatives to come on here and talk all i can talk to is the models of infallibility in the narrative i was raised with that i don't think are mm-hmm. uh i i don't think are tenable yeah i think a lot of oh, the yeah. other kind of defenses of, of both of those things because i i do think that inerrancy and infallibility are are different things mm-hmm. yeah um i do think that regardless of if you're you know wanting to kind of emphasize one over the other 
in relation to kind of the harder mm-hmm. inerrancy stuff, you're just going to end up shooting yourself in the foot, I think, because you're wanting to hold on to a certain account of the Bible that tells you what you need to know 100% yeah. of the time, <laughs> yeah, all the way through. This is the truth. This is the thing that you need to go back to yeah. mm-hmm. and what it means to live an ethical how life. Do, yeah. How do we um, be married? The Bible has to have the answer to this. Sure. And, what does it yeah. mean to be, you know, a person? What does it mean to be yeah. an ethical being yeah. who is trying to navigate the world? We have to appeal to the Bible because it gives us everything that we need to know. Right. Or at least like yeah. the most reliable thing. Mm-hmm. Right. But again, like, what why why do we think that yeah um this is very post-reformation stuff i think and i i don't think that most of the christian tradition has thought this way um which is why i've never really been comfortable taking on like inerrancy or infallibility Mm -hmm. that i've never really taken it that seriously i guess um, there are a lot of ways to treat scripture as a source of authority of the tradition. Oh, I know, and like so many people did that. On, right, <laughs> that don't depend on that. And, and and I think that there is, um, I think there's a few different things we need to approach this with. One is that I think it's okay for our primary preoccupations and concerns to not be the ones of the Bible, right? Yeah. So I sure. see this a lot in particular in the way in which Christians, um, sort of the post 2000, so I graduated from high school in 2007. So I was kind of a splash zone for some of the dumber moments of American evangelicalism. And, um, but, but I think that there's a, so there's a few things going on here. One is a need to see the primary concerns of the Bible and therefore God is the primary concerns of the interpreter, right? So this is an issue I have with, you know, some of these, like, he gets us ads going around right now that I find a little bit cringy, to be honest. The idea that, you know, like, this is everything Jesus said about racial reconciliation, you know? And so it's like, this is not, again, it's the need that there's nothing we can be worried about or should be worried about that would not be clearly in the Bible. Right. And that's just a, that's an idea I just straight up reject. I don't think that's true. Like one of the predominant concerns in the New Testament is something that I literally had never heard, have heard talk about in church in my entire life, which is how do Jews and Gentiles get along in light of the fact that the Messiah of Israel, the, the God of Israel, who we worship is the, is, is the Jewish God. How do Jews and Gentiles get along? That is such a predominant concern in the New Testament. And you would never know it if you went to a church anywhere in the United States because we don't think about that anymore. Yeah. We don't, that's not bothering mm-hmm. us. But 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 the the need to see our primary concerns is so dominant and so intense. So, you know, like when I talk about again, my my experience as a young person in the church, you would think the entire Bible was about straight men having sex with their wives in light of what church was like <laughs> when I was between the ages of like 18 and 21. <laughs> you would think the entire Bible was about a guy whose wife didn't want to have sex with him enough. And when she did, she, when she did, she wasn't super into it. Or like when she was always wanting him to like do chores with her, you would think that was the entire subject of the Bible when I was a young person, right? Again, because we need to see our primary problems reflected back at us. And the idea that the Bible is mostly about men having sex with their bored wives was an era we had in evangelicalism because I'm not, I'm not making this up. <laughs> this is <laughs> funny. Yeah. I'm not making this up. This is a real thing that happened. Uh, You would think that was what the biblical story was about. We don't actually mean going to the Bible and digging into it and thinking about what what it says and drawing back out on that. We think about opening, you know, and by we, I mean sad suburban men in 2010, you know, opening up the Bible and just seeing on every page a guy trying to have sex with his poor wife. And that's like, but, but this is a real 
problem in the way we talk about gender and sexuality in the church. And be, just because we're fixated on gay people getting married, just because we're fixated mm. on kids who are 15 who think they might be trans and want to go by a different name and change the pronouns that people use to talk to them, we think that the Bible must care about that too. Yeah. And it just doesn't because the Bible doesn't care about anything because the Bible's not a person. The Bible is a book. The Bible has no agency, right? But but we think that the biblical authors must care about this in the same way we do, and that's just the, that's the first thing I would just say we have to set aside. And, and, and I want to I want to make sure before we go too long. My point with all this is not a council of despair. My point is not that the Bible has nothing constructive to say about anything and that we just need to all like walk away from this, right? My point is that we need a hermeneutical project that is very different from whatever I am worried about is what God is worried about. So it's going to be in this book if I look at it. And the other thing we can't go to is that like we're just going to read it right off the page um and just whatever it says is correct because we're never actually going to get there there is just too much variety in the bible for that to happen so those are my two big concerns um what you what you were saying what you were kind of rejecting yeah and showing is like really problematic yeah. right yeah does Why have a solution work? with a yeah. christological hermeneutic that takes the revelation of god in, in yeah. christ this unconditional loving mm -hmm. Um, accepting <laughs> um, yeah. inclusive thing as the lens through which we read the Bible, everything mm -hmm. in the Bible, um, because this is the living God mm -hmm. who is meeting us here and now. And then we look back and read the text in the light yeah. of that. Um, I feel like I've, I've talked about this yeah. so much on this, yeah. on this channel, but yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and very specifically with an eye to new creation. What is what is indicated in the resurrection? Well, I mean that is that right. is new creation. Yeah. That's but, that's what that yeah. revelation is. Yeah. And what happens there is we have a conception of something like Genesis that we brought up earlier. Yeah. Being kind of transcended in mm -hmm. some way. Yeah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Male and female. Mm -hmm. There is something that's being transcended there, mm -hmm. I think, in Christ. Not erased, not obliterated, yeah. but transcended. Because mm -hmm. this is, the new creation is something that's new and transformed. Yeah, um, We're in a new existence in Christ mm -hmm. that we experience kind of faintly here and now. But it is real here and now. Mm -hmm. And we should live like it's real. And this is um, the foundational tension. Of we we actually gospel. should. Yeah. It, I don't think it's a tension. I think mm -hmm. it's we live out of this new reality now as we're awaiting the mm -hmm. arrival of the eschaton in full, mm -hmm. which is going to happen. But like this stuff is really driving a lot of what somebody like Paul was doing, being in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's most of what he says throughout his corpus. Like, being living in Christ, relating in Christ. What does it mean to, you know, relate peaceably, lovingly, you know, with long suffering, yeah. with, yeah. Uh, with hope, joy, yeah, um, all of those sorts of virtues. And in that's life, in, yeah, that's in Christ. And that, that is non, that is not constituted or determined by the way that we think about you know, gender and sexuality. Although yeah. those things are important um, to bring through, it's just that they're not determinative of who we are mm -hmm. in I, the same way that yeah. Christ is. Yeah. I would also want to say, because I think I think one thing that happens a lot when, at least when I, back when I was in evangelicaldom, the idea that there's neither man nor woman, neither Greek nor, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, this was often sort of wiped out um like kind of obliterated because like well but then we go and we see that paul has instructions for uh husbands and wives and paul does have instructions for slaves and slaves and enslavers right i think one thing that's the one very important practical thing to remember and again i am not saying that my point is not that paul was just crushing it and we just need to like transport our minds back to the first century because i don't think that's possible right i agree yeah. but i do yeah. think one thing that we should remember when we're looking at those household codes is that um 
we are in a habit of reading this as a um is sort of like a peaceful kingdom text right that like this is in the in the church of god this is how husbands and wives treat each other this is how masters and slaves treat each other and that is not the context that paul is writing to paul is writing to situations where most people who are in the church are the only christian in their family so that might be somebody who in the greco roman world this is very complicated and this is something i, I it's tough and I wish it wasn't in there. You might be talking about someone who has a slave. You might be talking about someone who much more frequently is a slave, but their, their enslavers are not Christians. Or you're talking to wives who are married to men who are not Christians, or you're talking to husbands who might have a wife in an arranged marriage that is not Christian. We're not looking, th this is not, the household codes are not a depiction of ideal relationships between social classes. This is the advice that is given at the time to the people who happen to be at the church at the moment that this is written. And I think that's really important to remember that when we are talking about wives submitting to husbands and husbands submitting, uh, uh, husbands, um, you know, loving their wives sacrificially and cruciformly, we're not talking about situations where the vast majority of these people are Christian couples raising Christian kids. This yeah. is advice that is extremely contingent and given to people in these really extreme and unusual circumstances. And that's something that needs to condition that reading. Um, I, I feel like a lot of times that passage is read as like, well, then the, the house fit perfectly together if she's following, but he's giving. No, that's not what's happening here because that's not how conversion worked in the ancient world. It didn't happen that often that people would become equally committed Christians at the same time. That's just not how it happened. So I think we need to realize that like all of this is contingent um, best also, practices counsel. Yeah. yeah. And also like related to that, we know that like if a, a member, like let's say a, a man mm -hmm. converts. He gets mm -hmm. baptized. Yeah. What happens then? His family gets baptized. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So they're, no, exactly. they're saved, yeah. Yeah. apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, church, yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though the, the other people aren't sort of consciously... How much they have... Con how, how sincere their conversion is. is we don't very, know. Right. But yeah, like, exactly. we know that yeah. family is converted. Yeah. In some sense. Yeah. Through Usually through if a, a person, person right. who is... If a person can't control the religious that, devotion yeah. of their whole household, then that whole family converts, right? Yeah. Um, and that's very, very different than the way that we think about conversion. No. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. And that's important. Yeah. That's very yeah. important. Um, because we in, the, you know, postmodern Western mm -hmm. world think about, you know, making decisions in terms yeah. of like, I make mm -hmm. a sort of discrete decision yeah. within my own kind of right. realm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't affect anybody else. Yeah. That's just not how it works. Yeah. So, like, so when we're, when we're talking about a guy in this context who is being told to sacrificially love his wife as Christ loved the church, his wife might be a Christian, but like the way in which this is corresponding might not be that she is faithfully following her husband as Jesus. It might be that she got baptized the other night because her husband told her to. Sure. And yeah. That's just what's happening yeah. now. Because you know, again, none of this is analogous to the way we do religion now, and we need to be realistic yeah, about exactly. that and like, and, uh, religion yeah. is not an appropriate category for yeah. this time so it, 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 it's not right and yeah. i'm sure i, I want to be really clear about it. i am sure to the good people at home that it sounds like i've been going down a thousand rabbit trails like i thought this was going to be about trans people and homosexual people and, and i my, my point with all this is not to run down a thousand trails my point is to open up the landscape of what are we actually talking about because like, what's not going to happen is that we're going to open the bible and be like let's see what the bible says about gender yes and we're going to pick yeah. five verses that talk about gender exactly right and yep. like there's going to be the conservative view and the liberal view and then they're both going to be these coherent pictures that's not what's going to happen because that's not how history works. And that's not what reading ancient texts looks like. We have to be able to open up the whole category to just be like, what is a family? What is marriage? What is religion? What is devotion? What are these texts? Who are they for? And if we can't come to a place that looks anything like our context in them, then I hope it is intuitive uh, as a listener, why we can't just take 
a blank reading of these texts in contexts that have nothing to do with ours and then apply them to very modern questions that have nothing to do with what Paul was talking about. Like a big thing is that if someone wants to argue that the Bible has this clear picture of what a marriage is supposed to be and it's between one man and one woman mm -hmm. and that's the way it is throughout the whole thing. I mean, that's just is not right. And if they come back and, you know, you point out this polygamy thing and they say, well, that was never what was supposed to happen. That's yeah, more of a narration there is that, and then yeah. a prescription. But and I think you made a good point with right. where God actually gives people these multiple wives. So that kind of, yeah, I think that does well, a lot then, of work. Does a lot and of good then work. I would tell you to drill down even further in that like a man and a woman is such a superficial correlation because then I would ask you like, what is a woman in this society? Is a woman like how much agency does a, a woman point. have? Is a woman, um, is this primarily a person who bears children? Because if so, is a marriage less valid if a woman cannot have children? There's a lot of texts in the ancient uh, world that suggest that's the case. Like the Mishnah makes a lot of space for the idea that an infertile man or an infertile woman can't really be married, for instance, right? Um, so like, if, is this perspective informing the Bible at all or, or any biblical text? Do we need to talk about that? Um, where does marriage come from? Is this something that is arranged or is this something that people pick for themselves? Because like, just because there is a man and a woman involved or like physically like to be crass about it, just because a penis and a vagina is involved, does this, it, it, are all the other cultural things coming alongside this in a way that matters? What is a woman and what is a man in this category? So that's like the whole other thing I would talk about. Yeah, yeah. this is great. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas, who apparently lives <laughs> in <Lizzie. Indiana. laughs> He's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. We're yeah. on the Near East side. Hit us up. <laughs> yeah. Please don't shoot us. <laughs> in a practical sense, like today in my life, I look at the LGBTQ plus community and I see a community that is severely uh, oppressed and mm -hmm. is not in a good place. So it seems to me like right off the bat, I should be on their side. Hmm. because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like that's where i go it, whether or not, whether or not what the bible says is a sin mm -hmm. or yeah. isn't a sin like i look and i see it as like this trumps that or whatever yeah. because maybe it's like either way before even looking into like how to answer that question is homosexuality a sin i see a group of people that are being put down taken advantage of and and mm -hmm. are really bad off I really love that instinct, Ethan. I really yeah, love so I that. Just, yeah, so that's kind of where I yeah. like, before anything, I'm on their side because, yeah, it's a group of people I see that need help. And the way I see it is, say, it is a sin or whatever, and they shouldn't be doing this, or, and that's not really where I'm at, but just if that's the case, then mm -hmm. I trust God to be there alongside people and... Like, mm -hmm. you don't not let people in because they're sinners, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's where I'm at with this in, like, a more practical mm -hmm. sense is that I'm not even as concerned because I, I, like, what you just did basically answered the question for me that, like, okay, well, there's not a clear picture. It's not no. clear and obvious. When people say it is, they're, they just don't understand what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So what's the most important thing is – helping oppressed groups of people in mm -hmm. our society today. If we can get to a point where LGBT people are not being taken advantage of and not oppressed and, and then maybe we can go from there and figure out, you know, but that's not mm -hmm. where I'm at necessarily. Cause I don't really see any issue with it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at. So I just kind of throw it to you guys. That's, say, a, really, that's a really intriguing place to start is just, what I mean, is it, it it's the, yeah. it's the liberational move yeah. um, that like is, has clear, Christological and theological mm -hmm. warrant to do is that we're we're siding with preferential people. option for the oppressed. We're siding with people yeah. who are clearly, you know, being damaged, harmed by the powers and mm -hmm. and situations around them, and that that should be where Christians are. Mm -hmm. We should, I think, side with with mm -hmm. people and who who are in those situations. I think that's. Mm -hmm. an instinct that most of Christendom does not do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's actually really helpful, I think, as a starting point. Even if I can give like you know my own kind of theological rationale for accepting, you know, mm-hmm. LGBTQIA plus people, it's kind of it's kind of a moot point, really. I really, you know, I think that's a really I, I, interesting. I think it, I think it yeah. just should be that we're yeah we're on the side of people who are being harmed and and damaged. Creepy. Yeah, and I could thank uh, Stephen Morrison, who you've had on here, you interviewed. He has a great I video like on Stephen. this whole topic, who helped me kind of yeah. put some of those thoughts together. So no, I, I think that's a really good way to th- start, and, and I think another really good place to think about it is just what is what is essential in Jesus's economy what what really is the thing that makes us who we are um and, and I think when I look at the idea of like being in Christ and like what does it mean to be in Christ there is a real relativizing of those categories um yeah which I I, I do think in, in some ways it, this is a um this is a conversation that Doug Campbell and I have had before, because I think when I had first really started out as a theologian, um, I had started to really push back on, um, I was not a fan of the idea that gender was truly relativized because I felt like as a, as a woman that, that felt to me like an erasure. It's like, you know, like I, I think the idea that like womanhood is essential to who I am is really important. Right. Um, and, And I think that, the further along I've gotten and the more I've really started to think about the category of being in Christ, the more comfortable I have gotten with the idea that um, our identity does not have to have eschatological importance to matter right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and to make us deserving of a perspective and a place at the table um, and when necessary protections. Um, that doesn't need to be something that is anchored in eternity to be true. Right. So like, I think there's a real, I, I, you know, in the age to come when we're all resurrected, I don't think it will matter. I was a woman in this life. I don't think it will. Um, right now it matters a lot. And like being a woman is a really big part of my identity and how I see myself and like the kinds of friendships I gravitate towards. But I think I can hold on to that and give that honor. Um, and, and also insist on the validity of my perspective now as a woman while not insisting that that therefore has a scatological importance, right? Um, Can I nuance that a little bit? Yeah, go for it. I, I yeah. do think it matters eschatologically and eternally mm-hmm. that you are a woman and that, mm-hmm. like, I'm a man and that, you know, mm-hmm. people would identify as certain genders mm-hmm. along, you know, this wonderful spectrum Mm -hmm. of genders um, identify as, I think that's good. And I don't think that's, it's transcended in a way that like, it's, it's just left behind. I know that Mm -hmm. that's kind of the place between like erasure and. Yeah. Relativize is kind Um, of a weird middle. Yeah. But I think it's, it's involved in, we're going to have like, a memory of who we are, I think. I don't think we get a memory wipe mm-hmm. in the age to come. Yeah. I, I, I do think that, like, who we are, what means the most to us, what is a, sort of important for our identity is brought through mm-hmm. um, into that. It may not be in, the, in terms of the spiritual bodies that we have, mm-hmm. per se, yeah. but I think it's involved in whatever it means to have some tr- mm-hmm. some sort of memory and continuity with our fleshly state now. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. memory is important here. Yeah. I wanted to nod really fast before to um before we run out of time to Reagan's uh how were eunuchs viewed in the ancient world and what was Jesus talking about yeah. about eunuchs in Matthew 19. This is a huge question. You asked and the I, right person. Though. Oh my gosh, and I can't <laughs> do justice to the subject right now. Uh, but there's some really fascinating material about this right now, right? Um, so it, it is generally true that like being castrated in the ancient world, particularly in the world of the Hebrew Bible, was this huge um, w- w- was was uh, was a huge tragedy, right? The idea that <laughs> a lot. 
<laughs> uh, the, there was a, yeah, the idea that being castrated was this huge tragedy that you can't have um, descendants, and that this means, in a real extent, that to a real extent, that you are more mortal and more finite than ordinary people are because you can't have uh, children. Um, and, and that's a huge theme that comes up whenever eunuchs emerge in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the idea that you know the eunuch laments that he is also a dry tree, he's only a dry tree, and that God transcends this and pro provides descendants in a family for the eunuch, right? Um, so what is really interesting is Jesus, and I want to be clear, Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is speaking into this tradition. Jesus seems to be received as a Jewish teacher in this. So I don't want it to ever be framed as Jesus, the Christian, correcting the Jews, right? Jesus is speaking in how to these situations. It is very interesting that Jesus um, draws on this tradition to pull on this idea that um to, to the, the sort of Hebrew Bible tradition of the, the eunuch being liberated and the eunuch having a, a divine place. Um, but the Matthew 19 passage is really strange. It does seem like this is an image that Jesus is drawing on to evoke celibacy, and celibacy specifically as a divine status that makes it um, easier for people to not... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm so distracted. But um, yeah, there we go. Okay, but um, sorry, the chat's getting weird. But uh, so, but um, Jesus is talking about the status of being a eunuch as one who is sort of free from the problems of lust that might compel one to get married, for instance. Um, in, in this one reading that I find very compelling, uh, that a friend of mine at Duke uh, did, is the idea that the image here of becoming a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven is specifically the idea of um, castrating, of uh, circumcising yourself. The idea that the act of uh, cutting off your foreskin would make it more easy for you to manage your lusts and therefore make it more easy for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, the idea that the foreskin is associated with lust and by cutting it off, one is more able to manage their feelings is one that uh, Andrew Riera has written a fair amount about, if you're interested in that subject. Uh, that's a different colleague at Duke I have who writes a lot about the anatomy of the penis because that's just who I He's an with. expert in yeah. that. He, um, we did a video about him on the channel, so. Okay, yeah, you Shout should look up his stuff on this. On penises, yeah. Yeah, exactly, because I think there's, there's something really interesting happening there specifically with the idea of controlling your urges. Like when you really get into this topic, there really is a lot going on. I mean, obviously we've got like the whole LGBTQIA plus, like there's more than just gay marriage on the table right yeah. here, right? Like we're talking about a lot of different things. And I think that's why I really like feel comfortable with the perspective I have because it doesn't like the whole liberation theology thing doesn't allows me to not necessarily take a stand on like how I think every issue like yeah because clearly there are people I mean like I, I guess it's the way I see it like clearly there are people on the extremes that are living unhealthy lives mainly based to how they interact with people sexually you know what I mean like there are well, people that yeah, and this could I be heterosexual be really or anything. I am in no way denying that our relationship as humans with gender and sexuality can't enslave us. I am, I am in no way denying that. I am not trying to make that case, that just sort of any any expression of this is, is healthy for us or good for us. I think that, like, my... The, the, the case I am trying to make is, and, and I want to be clear, this is, this is also not like a centrist case of just like some liberation, but not too much, right? What I'm trying to argue is that we need to take a full view of the entire field of what exactly it is we are looking at. And like when we are talking about gender, we're not just talking about gender expression as we are used to it in the last 25 years. And when we talk about marriage, we are not talking about marriage as it has existed since our grandparents got married. Like, let's open the field, let's talk, look at everything we are talking about. And from there, start with a dying and rising God who um, 
became one of us, became incarnate with us, who affirmed the goodness of humanity by becoming one of us and living with us and demonstrated that humility and died and rose independent of the limitations that humans have on us, these like ordering structures that keep the world the way it is. When we look at that, what perspective does this give us to the whole field, not just this small little part? That's what I want to talk about. Yeah, no, and that's totally where I'm at. And I just think the one thing I would point out is that kind of is challenging in today because that kind of puts you at odds with both the conservatives who we're mm -hmm. definitely going to disagree with, yeah. but also the like a majority of like liberals and whatever in our today that kind of want to affirm basically anything as long as there, there is no people. ideology because this yeah. is like this is a conversation john and i have had a thousand times that like you know when it comes to sexuality i don't think in ethics of consent only exactly it's sufficient yeah. right i think that there are ways in which you can consent to sex that hurts you um that we need to be honest about right and also that what that is differs tremendously from one person to another exactly um but I think that I think theology gives us the categories to think about the fact of, of the limits of what free will is. And just because we want something and just because we agree to something doesn't mean it's necessarily good for us. Um, mm -hmm. As a person who struggled with mental illness her whole life, that makes a lot of sense to me that like a lot of times I want things that are very destructive for me. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I bring that into the conversation with this? Right. It doesn't mean that I can't make adult choices it doesn't mean that i can't uh th th that mm. i don't have a valid voice here but it does mean that that is a perspective i need to take seriously it's easy to say that the cross is at the front when the bookends are so violent compared to the selfless son but i've tried